Hi, this is Misha. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the Japanese Type 14 Nambu pistol. Now, we have a video on the original Type A, the 1902 so-called Papa and Baby and all that. And that's really where this, this gun kind of takes its inspiration from. As early as 1916, Kajiro Nambu started trying to improve his design. He needed to make it simpler to mass produce, cheaper to mass produce, more reliable, and so on and so forth. Now he would work on this until 1924 when he would retire as a general. He would actually retire and begin his own uh, private company. But when he retired from the military, his unfinished prototype to replace the Type A was taken over by a committee. And they would work on this 1924 and 1925, and it would be adopted that year as the Type 14. It was the 14th year of the reign of the Taisho Emperor. One of the things that the committee added to the design is this manual safety here. If you remember the, um, the Papa Nambu and the baby did not have a manual safety, rather, they had a grip safety under the trigger here, which is now gone. Now, interestingly, we've kind of gone back to a rounded edge trigger like the original Grandpa Nambu, as well as a fixed lanyard loop. Now, this would be adopted in 1925, but not in production until 1926. I think the earliest surviving Type 14 we know of was made in 15, uh, uh, the year 15.11, which would be 1926. That would still be the 15th year of the Taisho Emperor, who would die at the end of that year in December. And his son, Hirohito, would take over, and his reign would be called the, the Showa reign. Now, 1926 was also year one of the Showa reign, although we don't know of any pistols made then. 1927, which was year two, they started to go into limited production. They would first be produced at the Chaguza Arsenal under Nagoya, or excuse me, I should say the Chaguza factory under Nagoya Arsenal supervision. Then the following year, which would be a, a three point date, in, in the Showa calendar, they would go into production at the Tokyo Koishika Arsenal. So we have two, two factories making these. This would continue at very low numbers in the beginning. And this gun differs from the Type A in quite a few ways. One, we've talked about the safeties, they're gone. We still have a rear cocking action, but the knob is simplified and quite different. We no longer have an external guide rod on either side. Instead, you'll see the, these uh, grooves cut into the bolt, semicircular grooves. Each of these would hold a spring. So we went from a single spring on the left side to two springs for the action. We're still using a striker system like the Type A. We still have the last round hold open on an empty mag, but if you pull it out, it goes forward, so not real effective there. The magazine catch is similar, but we went from the two-piece style in the Type A to a single piece, so cheaper, simpler, possibly uh, more durable, I would say. We went from finely checkered grips to horizontally lined grips, as you can see. This particular gun was produced at the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. It was made in 1930. The magazine is similar to that of the Papa Nambu. It's still nickeled, but it is not interchangeable. And we have horizontal lines instead of checkered lines in the grasping groups. The trigger is improved. It's a much smoother, lighter trigger than on the Type A. Actually, very nice triggers on these. We have fixed rear sights, which is adequate. We have a, about a 4.6 inch barrel. This was originally chambered for the same 8 millimeter bottlenecked 8x22 cartridge as the Type A, 
It's worth noting that around 1929, the Japanese military increased the, the powder charge, the load, the, the power. And that was thanks because of the, uh, the, dual, the dual recoil springs in these. So while the improved military design wasn't significantly more powerful, I think I've read about 15, maybe 20% at most, it was, and every little bit helps. It would still, the newer loading would still work in the older Type A Papas, but was pretty hard on them, so it was not advised because uh, they would break down because of the single spring. In a lot of other manufacturing ways, these are simplified. The frame, frame is a lot easier to make, the bolt, Early guns like this one were originally very nicely blued. They had straw colored small parts, and nice hand lacquered, Yoroshi lacquered uh, grips with full lines. They put a lot of tear, uh, care into these. These would first be issued and tried by the military in the late 1920s. And as we said in the Papa Nambu, originally in the Japanese military, they would um, have private purchase for high-ranking officers. So usually you would see these in the hands of lieutenants. This is because the Type 14 was relatively inexpensive. Their, um, their purchase was subsidized by the uh, Japanese government to encourage the, um, the purchase of, of domestic designs. It's also worth noting that these were sometimes issued to non-commissioned officers, NCOs, basically sergeants. So while officers, lieutenants, captains, so on and so forth, would purchase their guns, NCOs who actually needed a sidearm would sometimes be issued these, and they would see combat in, uh, in China. And they found a few problems. In 1932, there was what is known today as the Great Recall. What they would do, before they did not have a magazine disconnect safety on the guns, they would add it. This was because soldiers, this, again, th remember this was really the first mass-produced automatic pistol in Japan. Not every soldier was familiar with how to make it safe. They thought if they pulled the mag out, you know the story. So they added a magazine disconnect safety, so even if they accidentally left something in the chamber, they wouldn't shoot themselves. It's a very simple safety. It's a, a plunger and spring with a with a rotating block that when the mag's in, it rotates the block out of the way. As far as magazine disconnect safeties go, this is a really good one because it doesn't negatively impact the, uh, the trigger at all. It, it Only when it's active does it come in contact with your trigger at all. When it's inactive, when the magazine pushes it out of the way, it's completely off the trigger. So it doesn't make a horrible trigger feel like, say, on a high power would. That's kind of nice. Another thing they did Bear with me here. They would change the firing pin. To disassemble, you just press this button in. Um, screw this knob, the cocking knob. This is what is known as your striker guide. It's a cylindrical piece. Then we have a spring. It kind of drops out. And here is your firing pin. Now, with the spring in between them, these, when it's cocked, collapse together, like so. And then when you let the sear, when you pull the trigger, the sear lets off this tab and this springs forward. As with a lot of striker designs, this isn't terribly powerful. The original firing pin was longer than this by about, oh, I think it was about 15 millimeters. So it was longer, thus heavier. At the same time, the original striker guide was shorter by about 10 millimeters. The problem they were having, there just wasn't enough acceleration with the spring and striker guide on, this he on the original heavy firing pin. So they were getting light primer strikes, essentially. This would be doubly problematic in the cold of, of Manchuria. So they would recall the guns. They would make a minor modification to the frame to allow for a shorter firing pin and a longer striker guide to improve the, uh, the power behind the strikes. Pretty much every single gun would receive this upgrade, but it would take time 
They didn't have a whole lot of pistols in the field, but they did have um, several uh, over, you know, I don't know, 30,000. I don't really know the exact number. But, um, yeah, kind of interesting that they had to do that. Also, around the same time, you'll see quite a few changes in production. The original Chaguza arsenal, under Nagoya supervision, would cease making guns at about 7,800 produced. This was around 1932-1933. And in its place, the company owned by Nagoya, excuse me, the company owned by General Nambu at Koishika would take over. If you remember that Jaguza was producing under Nagoya supervision, well, Nambu's company would take over under Nagoya supervision. The change was announced in the early to mid-1933, and the first cocky bungee guns were turned out in the very tail end of that year. Now, at the same time, Tokyo Arsenal was handing over its production to the Kokora Arsenal. They would, at first, give they would, the Biscuit Kokor would build them and Tokyo would supervise and then later Tokyo would shut down and Kokor would build from leftover Tokyo parts and then finally by 1935 Kokor was making guns from all its own parts. This didn't last long though. By 1936 the factory at Kakibunji would be reorganized and change. It was still uh, you know, owned by Kajiro Nambu, but it would partner with another company and change names to Choyo Kogyo and continue producing guns. Also in 1936, Kokora would stop making Type 14s. So there's a little bit of a, a change up in 1936. One of the two companies would re reorganize and the other one would cease altogether. So here we are. Type 14s have been produced for less than a decade. We don't have that many in the field. And we already have had uh, four companies making them. We had, uh, we had the original. We had Tokyo. We had Kokura. We had Kokibunji. And as I said, the original, sorry, Chikusa, the original, which made the, the fewest number, fewer than 8,000. So production was pretty um, sp sporadic, still at pretty low numbers in the beginning for the first decade. What I'm holding here is a Kaki Bungie produced gun. This one was made in 1936. It's very similar to the Tokyo we looked at here. There are a few manufacturing differences that would be introduced to the design. The grips are made just a little bit differently. Safety is the same. I think this one has it. As you saw, that one had a cylindrical. Is that cocked? Strong spring. The cocking knob, the rib inside, that might be a lightning groove, is a little slimmer on this uh, cocky bungee gun versus the Tokyo. Yes, it does. Cool. One other change that was first introduced by Kokora was they changed the striker guide. If you notice, this is flat-sided. This was introduced at Kokora around 1934-1935, but would be made standard and carried over to Kakibunji a very short time later. The length of the guide is the same, the firing pin is the same. The reason they did this, with those two cylindrical pieces, one fitting inside the other, in the cold, that would have mo more metal contact and they could freeze together. Also, if it was left cocked and got rusty or grease got stuck in there, it could stick together, thus delaying strike from the firing pin and either making the gun not work at all or give light primer strikes. So by reducing metal contact, they were able to, again, improve reliability. And the Kaki Bungie factory would keep this design all the way through the end of its production because it was a good change. Now it's worth noting by 1936, Nambu's Kaki Bungie factory was the only factory turning out Type 14s under Nagoya supervision. All the Tokyo and Kokora uh, 
stuff would would uh, would be gone. Kind of my, it's kind of my way of putting these together. The Tokyo Arsenal used the stack cannonballs or clover leaf, or maybe even some people think flower, which I could see that icon or symbol. There we go. And Kokora would carry this symbol over. So you have to look at the proof markings to tell a Tokyo from a Kokora. The reason I know this is a Tokyo, however, is because it was made in 1930 and Kokora was not making guns even from Tokyo parts in 1930. So if you see a gun dated before 7 or 8, it's definitely, a, and it has the, the clover leaf for this cannonball symbol, it's definitely a Tokyo. After then, if it's after 8, it's definitely a Kokora. It's an easy way to tell. You can also look at uh, proof markings. Um, Terry and Bryant has a great website looking at uh, individual markings if, if you're interested in that. But yeah, this was the early Type 14s. As I said, the Kaki Bungie factory would be reorganized into Chuyo Kogyo in late 1936, and the Kokora Arsenal would be out of production. All told, between Tokyo and Kokora guns, they would produce about 35,000, so not a large number. Now, when Kaki Bungie got started, they would pick up where the Chikusa arsenal had left off, which was around 7,800. So they would continue manufacturing. They would also start to introduce some changes to the design. In 1939, one of the first changes they would introduce would be this large expanded trigger guard. If you remember the original Grandpa Nambu had a small guard, then the Type A had a larger one, and then really the, the first Type 14s had the same if not larger than the, the Type A, the Papa, and now we're going to an even larger one. This is sometimes called the Winter Trigger or the Manchurian Trigger Guard because soldiers were having to wear gloves in Chinese Manchuria they needed a larger guard to get to their trigger without having to fuddle or squeeze their finger. And the problem is you can get your a gloved finger in a small trigger guard, but when you do, there's a very good chance of you accidentally pulling the uh, trigger. So this gives you plenty of room to get in before worrying about having to pull. That was around October of 1939. Soon after, they would go from the original lined, fully lined grips with 30, uh, excuse me, 25 grooves to these simplified ones with 17 grooves, leaving the top unlined, but still the bottom has line. And then finally in December of that year, they would introduce this secondary magazine retaining spring at the front of the grip. The original, if you look here, you can grab one for a sec, essentially had a drop free mag. Press the button, mag shoots out. This is why so many small trigger guard guns are, mi are mismatched on their mags. Because people would sometimes accidentally hit the, the mag catch, which to be fair isn't terribly well protected. It's more or less flush with the grip, but not shielded in any way. So mags would accidentally be lost. With this, when you press the button, I might have to do it this way, sorry. Nothing happens. You have to press and also pull. This spring here has a corresponding in internal part about the same shape and that latches in to this cutout at the front of the magazine. Now notice these mags are still nickeled. We have gone to a simplified base now. Instead of being made of this nice heavy alloyed metal, now we're what most consider pot metal. It's still perfectly good, but a little bit of simplification on the base. I'm not sure when Kaki Bungie would introduce this, but you know, you start to see it in the 1930s guns. So three relatively major changes at Kaki Bungie in the towards the end and the last part of 1939. And remember, they're still the only factory making these. 1940 rolls around and then 1941. These guns up until this point still have strawed bolts, triggers, safeties small parts. We have still have a nice lined caulking knob here, V-notch sides. We still have Yoroshi lacquer on the grips, even though we took a few lines off. 1941, 
Hockey Bungie would finish the first series, or the real I shouldn't say the first series, the no series. They would get serials up to 99,999 and then roll over to the first series. At the same time, Nagoya would supervise a second plant, which was opened at the Toriyamatsu factory. Toriyamatsu and Hockey Bungie would share the first series because they were both being made under Nagoya Arsenal supervision. And before we get into too much to that in the wartime, this is a uh, 1940 Kaki Bungie with the first round of updates. Still very finely made, still very nice. Internally the same as earlier ones. Now as the war would go on, Kaki Bungie and Toriyamatsu would make changes at different, different levels. Let's talk about the, the Kaki Bungie first since I'm holding one. They would continue manufacturing the Type 14 until 1944. They would stop around August of that year. While they would make a few simplifications, for example, they would go from the strawed bolt to the blued bolt, Kaki Bungie would continue strawing other small parts like the trigger and the safety. They would also retain this style of cocking knob. On the other hand, they would go from a nickeled magazine body to a blued one, and they would stop adding actual Yoroshi lacquer to the grips. They would keep using this style of grip all the way to the end, but they would go to a simple brushed on uh, cheap lacquer as opposed to a nicely uh, processed Yoroshi. But basically, a later production Kaki Bungie Type 14 would look very much like this with a few simplifications. Also the bluing might not be quite as nice and there would be more tool machining marks. But they would discontinue in August of 1944 to focus on Type 94 and other production projects. They would never get out of the first series. They would never finish their, their half of the, uh, of the first series. So that's pretty much all that happened at Kaki Bungie. Now on the other hand, Toriyamatsu, which was started in late 1941 and had its first pistols appearing by the end of that year, would take the design further, especially with simplifications. They would introduce the blued magazine in 1942, early on. They would also stop strawing the small parts and go to bluing. In 1943, they would start machining the trigger pin heads flush with the, well, trigger frame here. That's, I mean, it was probably faster to do, but it doesn't look as elegant. But on the other hand, it had some benefits. Now, they would use 24 line grips, and they would switch to the simple lacquer as well. In 1944, early in January, they would go to this round, simplified cocking knob. The back is just smooth, simple checkered round head. They would also switch the rear sight up. We're now going to a simple notch, and they made it shorter back here. They just basically cheapened up the machining back here. This particular gun was made in January of 1944, so it has the first round of true wartime simplifications that you can really notice. Another thing, Kaki Bungie would use the same style of striker and firing pin as we saw on, on the earlier guns, but Toriyamatsu would um, introduce a different one. Boop, boop. They would go to a round striker guide. They would introduce a longer spring for it. Come on. And an even shorter firing pin. Again, we're trying to improve reliability. So we, get, we are going to a shorter firing pin, a longer spring, and a longer striker guide. Again, it, it efforts to... Come on improve reliability. Mm -hmm. 
worth noting that they never really got this system down 100%. Early on and even to the end, most Nambu Type 14s were issued with a spare firing pin. The, the chances of it breaking the tip off, the tab off here, or the tip in the front were high enough that they felt like they needed to issue spares all of the way from the beginning to the end. But they did get it to be more reliable thanks to all these changes they were introducing over time. Tori Matsu would finish their part of the first series in late 1943, and they would start on the second series. And while Kaki Bungie would stop Type 14 production, Tori Matsu would continue all the way through World War II. You see my tactic, I just keep pressing it till it fits into the thing because we're, we're rotating it together. Sometimes they line up quickly, sometimes they don't. There we go. Up to this point when this gun was made, manufacturing was still quite good. There are some more visible tool marks. The bluing's a little more military grade bluing, but um, still very nicely done guns. Still have the large trigger guard, of course, lined grips. They still have a nice quality to them. Also beginning in 1943, the old system of Japanese officers purchasing their guns was abandoned. The war was, um, they were starting to fight more and more of a defensive war. They had more and more officers coming in. They started to simply issue the Type 14 to everyone. So it became literally standard issued in, in Japan. It was the uh, official sidearm of the Japanese Army and Navy from the beginning when it was adopted. but. Now it became standard issue for everyone in 1943. But as the war wore on, more simplifications had to be introduced. Let's get this over here, I think. This gun was produced in April of 1945, so we're getting pretty close to the end of the war. The major difference, simplification, are these slab-sided wooden grips. These would be introduced around November of 1944, which would be 19.11 in the uh, Showa calendar. Again, only at Toriyamatsu because Kakibunji was no longer making these guns. That's the major simplification. The bluing we continue to get weaker and weaker, and you'll see more and more manufacturing marks like here and here. Cocking knobs a little rougher made. Lanyard loop is a little rougher made. The back strap has more chatter and stuff on it. So just what you'd expect. These uh, wooden grips were faster to make, of course, but they were also quite weak. You'll see most of these have cracks, or at least a good, good number will have cracks. The magazines themselves will also get a little rougher looking. But of course, by 1945, the war was all but over. So the fact that they were still managing to even make Type 14s is pretty remarkable. The last true production Type 14s were around June, maybe early July at Toyamatsu. After that, in July and August, the so-called last ditch Type 14s were being turned out. And these guns were assembled from anything they could find. They were basically sweeping the floors and digging through bins and looking in the backs of old drawers for parts. They were built from previously rejected parts. You'll even see some leftover parts brought over from the discontinued production line at Kaki Bungie. And just whatever they could do. As some were marked, some were dated, some weren't. Serials weren't always matched or even serialized total. Really, just about anything goes with the last ditch production Type 14s because they were throwing together guns any way they could. Up until this point, even a gun like this made in April of that year would be safe to fire. The last ditch guns are probably safe to fire, but they're rare enough and collectible enough I personally wouldn't. Plus, you just don't know. A lot of them don't even have inspector stamps, so they never went through final inspection. All bets are off with those, but it is interesting that they were just, they were throwing the guns together literally right up until the end of the war. So they, they, they were very determined. No one knows exact production numbers for the Type 14, but 
estimates range from 250,000 up to 270, 280,000 in that vicinity. This was definitely the most mass produced sidearm in Japan before, during World War II. The standard issue. And all in all, it was a uh, it was a good gun. It really it wasn't great, but it was good. Just kind of comparing early production to late production here. <laughs> it had a good trigger. It was reasonably reliable, if not fantastic. It was very accurate. And it was made entirely in Japan. So there's a point of national pride there, of course. Which was a very common attitude in, in that era and still even is today. On the other hand, the 8mm cartridge, even after it was kind of uh, loaded hotter in 1929, was still pretty anemic. It was more powerful than, say, 380, but it was never up to snuff with, say, 9mm or 45 ACP. On the other hand, these are mostly used as badges of rank by officers, although, of course, since Japan was fighting a war, they were used. I mean, the fact that Toriyamatsu was desperately trying to continue making them at the end of the war shows that they were being used in combat. If it was just an ornament, they would have discontinued making these much earlier. But, you know, it's definitely a defensive gun. What's interesting, these guns are in a way longer. They're, they're lighter than a 1911, and they have a very nice kind of Luger-style grip, nice angle to them, nice trigger, very ergonomic. The grip is a little slim for some people with large hands, but since I have smaller hands, it actually feels quite well. But when you measure it front to back, top to bottom, it's actually a little larger than the uh, Colt 1911. It's just more spindly, more uh, svelte and like the barrel sticking out. I've always found them interesting. When I got into guns, the Type 14 wasn't that really well thought about. People buying World War II guns looked for Colt 1911s, or they looked for um, Lugers, or even P-38s, but uh, the, the Type 14, there are collectors. I know some that have hundreds and even thousands of these, but they were pretty uh, undesirable. Nowadays, they're starting to get quite a bit of interest, which is interesting, which is really good, because this was Japan's standard issue gun. It saw extensive combat over a 20-year time span, nearly, and um, was produced uh, over a quarter million. So it's an interesting gun. It's, a, it's unfortunate the ammunition is uh, so hard to, to come by these days because they actually shoot really well. Even if they do have the, the worry about maybe breaking a, uh, a uh, firing pin. That's why I'm not dry firing these much. It's just not a really great idea to dry fire the, uh, the Type 14 Nambu. Unless you have snap caps, which I don't have for 8mm. But yeah, that would revisit this gun here and look at it in more detail. After World War II, most would be confiscated out of Japan. Quite a few would be destroyed. But a number were left behind in, in China and Korea and would be used by uh, several militaries and paramilitary groups throughout the 1950s and 60s. Some were still in use by Vietnam. The real limiting factor, again, though, was the, um, was the caliber, getting 8mm. It wasn't a standard caliber, so most people would switch over to something in 9mm or 45 as quick as they could. But today it's an interesting collectible, made by uh, five different factories. So there's all kinds of small variations, kind of like with the Arasaka rifle. There's all small things, like for example the lanyard loop changes size. The cutout and the frame down here varies in size from time to time. And of course you get to the late wars and so all kinds of interesting little oddities you'll find. But yeah, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we welcome them below. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, we'd really appreciate it if you could find the time to do so. No, no rush, just whenever you can. And if you like Japanese guns, we have several other videos. You might want to check those out. They're in a couple of different playlists. As always, this is Misha. We really appreciate you tuning in. And we'll catch you next time.